So let's just talk about the United States first, because, uh, you know, Greece and Europe, what's happening is a, is a, I want to talk about that, too. But first, in the United States, so is there really – Barack Obama – so the, am I been making the case on my show that Donald Trump just puts the ugly face on government – that we've been doing all along and that Barack Obama put a lot of people to sleep for all the ugly stuff he did, including economically, not only bombing, you know, uh, the Middle East nonstop. And, <laughs> you know, you know, know. I call that? Foreign policy becomes drone whack-a-mole. It's, um, it's unbelievable. So he's been bombing these people, creating refugees. And then when the refugees get here, Trump stops them. And everybody's like, you can't stop them. But they don't mind if Barack Obama co- caused them. It's no, like, no, no, even before that, go back to Bush. I mean, think about the fact that the people caught in the airports and the travel ban were Iraqis who risked their lives to help us as translators. I mean, you know, where's the equity in that one? No, absolutely. And that and that was happening as, back when the Arab Spring started back in 2011. Barack Obama absolutely. stopped the... Yes, yeah, so that's the way. It's like Barack Obama, for the left to get upset at his policies of bombing, that he would actually literally have to bomb them at the airports in America, and then they might get pissed off about it. No, the one that gets me with Obama with this one is like, oh, but he had this Republican Congress, and like he couldn't get anything done, and it was so unfair. He knew that going in. That's a constant, not a variable. If you know that's the gig, you go in and you fight. How many times did Reagan go on television to get above the parapets and get over Congress? I think it was seven times. How many times did Barack do it? Zero. Remember when he made his, remember when he made his defining speech of the generation about inequality and then they focus grouped it and it disappeared? Yeah, absolutely. So he, uh, so inequality keeps growing and Barack Obama uh, comes in and... and it keeps growing under under him also. So is that it was Ralph Nader correct? Is Bernie Sanders correct? Do we have one party economically in America? I think we do, but I think what's happening with Republicans now is absolutely fascinating in this regard. Because what Bannon represents and what Trump represents, the sort of neo nationalist split in the Republican Party, is a profoundly anti globalist, anti consensus movement. And what they tapped into, which was already there, the simmering well of discontent when the blue wall fell down because the Democrats didn't even think it was appropriate to go and visit their own core supporters until it was too late. But what they tapped into was a bunch of people who have seen the reality of having their community's assets stripped, have been sold down out, and then having politician after politician, both left and right, come to them for 25 years and say, vote for me, jobs, vote for me, better future. And every day and every week and every year, more people on meth, lower wages, more stress in the community, right? more crappy roads, more crappy schools. And finally, they just say, you know, I figured this out. You're all liars. And along comes Trump. And Trump actually says, you know what, this trade stuff's really to you guys. And you're like, yeah, you, oh, my God, he actually just said that? Did he just say that? Because we've been saying that for years, right? Yeah, and you know what else? It's, it's, it's these guys are making out like bandits, the Wall Street guys, the whole lot. They're the ones that get bailed out. Where's your bailout? Oh, my God, he sounds like Bernie Sanders. So you've got this movement in the Republican Party. Now, whether they do anything about it for working people is an entirely different thing. But they've tapped into that, and they have broken that consensus wide open. So the interest in that Obama was very much the guy for change who basically maintained the status quo. And what you've got now is the guy who's running the party that is meant to be the status quo, and he's busting up status quo seven ways to Sunday in some truly destructive ways, but he's not a consensus player. So uh, how, did we, how did we get here? Can you, did it all start with Reagan? Because we had income inequality like this during the Gilded Age. And then Teddy Roosevelt came along and did the antitrust. Barack Obama wouldn't even enforce the antitrust laws. So Yeah, exactly, yeah. You know, I mean, think about things like Uber and Amazon and all the rest of it. I mean, Uber is basically a giant jobs destruction machine for retail. You know, that's what Amazon does, right? Yeah. I mean, Uber essentially uh, a monopoly play for every taxi market, undercutting every taxi system that's there. And then once they finally push everybody out of the market, they become monopoly players. I mean, this is exactly what antitrust was written for. So So anyway, to to get back to the question, though, like, let's pick it up. So I've got a short way of telling this story that hopefully makes sense to people. And if anybody wants it, I've got a paper on it, and it's lying around. 
uh, that they can get a hold of. But um, or I'll send you a copy and stick on the website. But anyway, um, short version goes like, well, the global Trumpism piece in foreign affairs sums this up. So look, here's the deal. Back in the 1940s, you've come off of fighting fascism and you've got the Soviet Union there occupying half of Europe. And the capitalist classes of the West go, we nearly died. We nearly lost everything. So this time around, we need to make sure one thing happens. We can't just squeeze labor for profits. We basically have to discipline capital to make sure that they invest at home. We need to keep the barriers on capital so that banks can't just move money around to make money and cause disruptions. And we created a kind of what was called an embedded liberal economy rather than a sort of open liberal economy. And that created this big middle class of high wage growth. And what it meant with firms was you had COLA contracts, strong unions, strong businesses. And that meant that you had a kind of partnership in growth. Now, the reason business went along with this is because they didn't really have an alternative. And what it forced them to do was to innovate rather than just squeeze labor. Now, the problem with this system was over a 30 year period, and there was a Polish economist called Mikhail Kalecki who saw this in 1943 and wrote about it, and he literally predicted the 1970s, it's an incredible little piece. Again, I can send you a copy of it on the website, seven pages long. And he says, here's your problem. If you constantly try and target full employment as the policy goal, you're gonna end up dragging even low wages higher and higher. And the only way businesses can respond is by pushing prices up and up. So if wages go up, prices go up, wages go up, you're going to end up with inflation. And inflation kills capital because ultimately it's a tax on investment. If you're expecting a 5% rate of return, you've got a 7% inflation, you might as well shut the shop now. That was the 1970s. So to get rid of the inflation, we jack up interest rates, we open up capital markets, we deregulate the banks, we globalize production, we do all this stuff. And what happens is beginning in about 73, but accelerating in 1980, productivity and wages used to move exactly together. And now productivity does this and wages does this. Right. And that's the gap. Now, where's all that cash going to? It's going to the corporates. It's going to the top. It's going to the banks. This is the beginning of the inequality skew. But here's the thing. What are we targeting now? What we target now is price stability, all the stuff about independent central banks and inflation is the worst thing possible because that's a way of guarding the real returns on profits. So you run this out for 30 years and you end up with a very weird world. It's the opposite of the 70s. It's one where no matter how much money you dump into the system, there's no inflation. And it's one where you don't have to play nice to labor because if they ask for a pay rise, you can ship their job abroad. And you can't really augment their jobs with capital and improve them because 80 percent of them in the service sector. How do you give a hairdresser automation? Do they have a giant pair of electric shears? Right. What does it do? Right. How do you automate home health care? How do you automate elder care? You don't, so you've got a lot of low productivity sectors. All of this is coming together at the time when to make ends meet because taxes have been cut, public goods aren't being produced. What happens? People have taken on boatloads of personal debt and their wages aren't rising. There's no inflation to eat away the value of the debts. The creditors are knocking on the door. They're financially stressed. And the parties like the Democrats, the mainstream Democrats have the temerity in the Samoan to come out and say, everything's fine. We are protecting Barack Obama's legacy. <laughs> and, and, and quite rightly, 50 million people go, hang on a minute. The majority of American workers earn less than $22 an hour. What do you mean everything's fine? And then we find out that 94% of jobs created since 2008 are part-time contract agency irregular and usually have no benefits. Uh... And you wonder why people are pissed. So and they don't believe a word mainstream Democrats say. I I couldn't be yeah I couldn't you know what here's what I tell people and it's even liberal lefty news people commentators and it makes their head explode when I say well what do you call a system that takes the richest country the face of the earth has ever seen the United States and renders half its population poor or in yeah. poverty. What do you call that system? That's a failed system. And that's why we need a revolution, which is what Bernie was calling for. And they go, where are you getting these facts? Half the country's poor. I don't know. Google it. So, yeah. so, so uh, here, I'll give you a better one. Not even a better one, but I'll give you one that I like to pull out, right? So who votes? Young people or old people? Old people. Right. Oh, right. Now, we have to take care of our seniors. The one thing the Republicans and the Democrats care about, we have to take care of our seniors, right? What's the poverty rate of seniors in the United States? It goes from a low of 4% to a high of about 9%. What's the poverty rate of millennials? 20 to 25%. What society shorts its young to feed its old? This one, because they're the ones who vote. They vote twice as much. 
Let me give you my favourite little one just now. The last thing that Congress did under the old administration, that everybody joined together in a big group hug, was a thing called the Cancer Moonshot. And it's a good thing. Joe Biden's son died of a terrible brain disease, blastoma, and they got together and they found $6.2 billion to fast track new therapies and do a cancer thing and all the rest of it. Now, just think about this for a minute, right? $6.2 billion. Congress has what's called an offset rule. And that means unless you're raising new revenues, if you want to spend that money, you've got to take it from somewhere else. You know where they took it from? No. Preventative no. care. <laughs> now, who gets cancer? Old people. Who benefits from preventative care? Millennials, particularly millennials in poverty. So as well as all the rest of the stuff that's going on of the rich, the poor, the creditors, the debtor, we've actually got the young eating the old's lunch. Or rather, sorry, <laughs> the other way around, the old eating the young's lunch. And the old are the ones who vote en masse. And the majority of Trump supporters were boomers. Oh, right. Yes. Mm -hmm. 